Danielle, quick question for you. For you. Um, do we have an idea of the approximate number of people who have signed in for this meeting this morning? Um, and this excludes the panel members. There are 48 participants. Oh, actually, you know, if it, I have to give a different count. If it's excluding the panel members, I'll give you a count in just a second. There are 33 attendees on the line. Thank you. Good morning. This is Karen Nakano, the chair of the um, advisory panel for the CDLT. And we are currently doing a few last minute administrative things. We will get started in approximately five minutes. We want to ensure that the speakers for the various presenters are, have uh, access to the teleconference line. So we will start in approximately five minutes at, at uh, 9.05. Thanks.
this. <clears throat> Karen, are you on? You, you got in. She's listed as an attendee. You're listed as an attendee. Okay, so it's about 9.06, and for the moderator, if you could let me know if we have anybody signed in from the following organizations, that would be great. We're trying to contact the actual presenters to ensure that they have been able to sign in. Do you have anybody who has signed in from the American Clinical Laboratory Association? Please let me know. How would I be able to tell that? I, I can't see that from, from so, the participants. Okay. Um, so the speakers that you have and the presenters, is there anybody from the American Clinical Laboratory Association? Do you have Sharon West who is signed in? Sharon West is signed in. Is it possible to unmute Sharon's line? Sharon is not connected properly. Okay, thank you. Do you have anybody from the American um, Society for Clinical Pathology? For the presenters, a Mr. Matthew Schultz. I don't see that person. Okay, and do you have, um, for the Association for Molecular Pathology, Drs. Anthony Serechi and Dr. Aaron Bossler as a presenter? I don't believe I see any of those, too. So we just received an email from Mr. Paul Sheaves. He is um, signed in. Is he signed in as a presenter? He will need to be able to uh, have his line um, unmuted so he can speak. Okay, I'm still looking for Paul. I don't see his name yet. So he has just emailed us and, said, and indicated that he is on. Is he on his PS? He might be dialed in, but he's not connected through uh, WebEx. I don't see his name yet. Okay. So Danielle Scalfo is also on the line, and she is m m on mute. Has she signed in as a presenter? She has not, almost everyone on the line has not signed in the correct way. I just sent out instructions again. I actually posted instructions this morning um, to share my screen with the instructions with how to dial in correctly. All the presenters on the line have not connected with their audio. All of our panel, they have, they have connected the proper way. So for the, those who are on the line, um, that would be Mr. Paul Shees, Mr. Matthew Schultz, if he's on, Drs. Anthony Serechi and Aaron Bossler, Dr. Ronald McLaughlin, uh, Ms. Danielle Scalfo. If you could follow the instructions in the agenda for presenters, and the instructions are a little tricky. Yeah, they're all in as 
And the instructions are to use the link in the agenda for presenters to get into WebEx. Once you get into WebEx, you are to use the instructions to dial in. So you're going to use a phone to dial in. When you click on that option, you're going to see a pop-up balloon, and there will be a 1-800 or a toll line to call. There will be a password, and then you will be assigned a number, your attendee ID, followed by the pound. If you follow those instructions, then you will get into the system for the audio portion, and it will link to your name with the profile, and that way the moderator can identify the line you are using. So right now what the mod moderator is seeing is just the fact that you signed in. She cannot identify who you are. So if you are a presenter, that's Drs. Anthony Sarechi, Aaron Bossler, Ronald McLaughlin, Mr. Paul Sheaves, Mr. Matthew Schultz, Ms. Diane Scalfel, you need to um, disconnect your current telephone line, get into the agenda for the meeting, go into the link for the WebEx that says this is for presenters, click on I'm going to call in. When you call in, you're going to be given a toll line, a nine-digit password, and your own audio attendee number, which you will be asked for during the recording, and you are to enter that number with the pound sign. This will allow you to be identified with a specific line, and this way we will be able to identify you as a presenter. So having said that, let's um, start this meeting at 9.30, and we're going to give time to the presenters to log in. If the presenters are still having problems getting access, please continue to email myself and Rashida and or Glenn McGurk because this way we can quickly communicate with the moderator. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Most of them are already logged on. They just need to follow the instructions I posted in the, in the chat. Once they do that, they'll be fully connected. Hi, Danielle. This is Rashida. I just want to confirm that you've provided the presenters with the proper um, link. Should they be connected using the attendee link or the presenter link? They can connect using the attendee link. Okay. So using the attendee link, link they should still also be able to um, connect using WebEx and then follow the instructions where they use the attendee ID. Yes, I've went ahead and I'm just sending instructions out one by one, but I've um, I've provided these instructions already in the chat. Most of them are connected to WebEx, they're just not connected to audio with their profile. If they're connected, does this mean they can still speak? Are you able to just allow them to speak even though their audio is not connected? No, that would require me to unmute all the lines, and I'm not sure that there would be a lot of background noise. So 
having them connect to their profile with WebEx would be a more sufficient way. Okay, thank you. So we've been getting emails regarding the fact that the presenters did not potentially get the link for the web and, uh, for WebEx. So if you go into the agenda, which is posted online, the agenda for today's meeting, you will notice about a third from the top, a line that says for WebEx, all presenters must use this link. So if you use that link, that should be able to get you into that portion of WebEx, which will then ask you to indicate for the audio portion whether you're going to use your computer or call in and there's a third option. Please click on the option that says, I will call in. When you click on that option, it will provide for you three numbers. The first number is the toll number to call. The second number is a nine-digit identification code, which you will then punch into the telephone. And then you will be prompted to indicate your attendee ID, and it's usually one or two digits, followed by the pound sign. Once you follow these instructions, then your profile, which was your name, first, last, and your email, will be linked to the line that you've just been assigned, and this way you will be able to speak. So please, again, uh, go to your agenda for the meeting, look for that portion of the agenda that says that this is the line that, uh, the link that presenters must use. It says webinar information, Meeting presenters must use this link. Go into that link. Once you are in, it's going to ask for your profile information, your first name, last name, and your email. You're going to hit join. Then you're going to be given the choice to either use your computer system to, for the audio portion versus dialing in with a telephone and there is a third option. We ask that you use the second option or the option that clearly states that you are dialing in. Once you dial in, you will see, um, once you click on that option, you will see a balloon with three numbers. The first number is the toll number. The second number is your, um, the meeting ID number. It's nine digits. And the last number is your attendee, attendee ID usually one or two numbers, followed by the pound sign. You will be prompted, once you use the toll number, to give these numbers. Once you complete the sequence, then you will be able to speak because the audio number ID will now be associated with your profile. And then the moderator will be able to identify which line you're on and therefore be able to unmute your line. So we're going to wait for another six minutes and then we will start the meeting. Thank you.
Danielle, this is Karen again. Quick question for you. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So is Paul Sheaves still uh, an attendee? Yes, and he still has not connected to audio. Using his profile, I've sent him instructions through the chat message directly, and he still has not connected. Okay. Um, also, what about Matthew Schultz, Danielle Skelfo, John Warren? Are they still considered attendees? They are still considered attendees, but I don't see... Um, I do see Danielle. Okay, what's the next? Name? Uh, John Warren. Okay, I don't see John Warren. Okay. What about uh, Drs. Uh, Aaron Bossler and Anthony Sarechi? Okay, I don't see either. Okay, thank you. So for the speakers, we have just sent another email with the WebEx link to use. And so please, if you have signed in already as an attendee, please sign out and use the other link in WebEx that we have just forwarded to you via email. Karen, a lot of people have joined WebEx, but they still have not connected to audio. They just have to follow the instructions I posted in the chat messages. They would be required to hang up their connections at this time, hit communicate at the top, then audio connection. A pop-up box will appear, and it will be instructions on how to connect to audio using your profile. Thank you. So we're going to give them another five minutes. So hopefully they will be successful in getting through the WebEx system so that they can speak.
want to join. All right, so um, Danielle, I'm not sure how we're going to resolve this, but doc, uh, Dr. Sorecci and Paul Shi still are not able to um, get into the system. For Dr. Sorecci, um, the instructions for the audio will occur when you click on I'm going to call in. And then once you dial the toll number, you should be able to get verbal instructions then to enter the nine-digit number and then your ID. I'm glad to s I think you've gotten your profile set up if you've gotten to the point where um, you have the choice to indicate how you're going to sign in for the audio portion. So what I think I'm going to do is, it's currently 9.30, what I'd like to do is have the presenters continue to try to get into the system so that they can have the uh, capabilities to speak and to present. And what I'd like to do is start, and we will readjust the presentations so that we can hear from these presenters accordingly. So what we'd like to do is um, start the meeting, and we're going to go to slide two and three. And first of all, I just want to say that um, this is the second meeting for the Medicare Advisory Panel on Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Tests. And what I wanted to do first of all is thank the public, the commenters, the presenters, and the panel members for supporting this process on such compressed timelines. And CMS really appreciates the effort and time that everyone has put in to make this meeting possible. Next slide, please. Next slide. And what I'd like to do now is take the time to indicate that we have transcriptionists online and they will be interjecting intermittently if they cannot hear you. And then I would like to have um, the panel members indicate the, um, who they are, what organization they're currently with, and whether they have any conflict of interest. We're going to go in alphabetic order. So the first person would be Jeffrey Baird. If he's here, please raise your hand, and then Danielle will unmute your line and then go ahead and speak. Uh, hi, I have to unmute my own line. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Baird. I'm the interim chairman of the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I have no conflicts of interest to uh, disclose. Thank you. The next uh, panel member is Dr. Vicki Basileski. Please unmute her line. So, Dr. Basileski, there you go. Uh, good morning. Um, this is Vicki Basileski. I'm a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee, and I have no conflicts to declare. Thank you. Dr. Bauer, is Dr. Stephen Bauer. Can you please raise your hand and your line will be unmuted? Okay, thank you. Dr. William Clark. Okay, thank you. 
Dr. Hamilton. Excuse me, Ms. Judy, Ms. Judith, Ms. Judith Davis. You're I'm right. Judy Davis. I'm director of quality management in the laboratories at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Thank you, Ms. Davis. And then uh, Dr. Stanley Hamilton. Okay. The next panel member is Dr. Uh, Raju Kuchalapati. Please raise your hand. And can you unmute his line? Hello, this is Raju Kuchalapati. I'm a professor of genetics and medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. The next panel member is Dr. Brian Loy. Good morning. This is Brian Loy. I work for Humana. We're headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, and we're a payer, and I do not have any conflicts of interest to report. Thank you. The next panel member is Ms. Gail Marcus. Go ahead. Hi, this is Gail Marcus, and I'm a professor at Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and I do not have any conflicts. Great. Can the panel members who have already introduced themselves please um, unraise your hand? The next uh, panel member is Dr. Carl Morrison. Okay. The next panel member is Dr. Victoria Pratt. Can we please unmute her line? Hi, this is Dr. Victoria Pratt at Indiana University School of Medicine, Director of Pharmacogenomics and Molecular Genetics Laboratories. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Thank you. The next panel member is Dr. Michelle Schoonmaker. And go ahead, Dr. Schoonmaker. Hi, this is um, Michelle Skimaker. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Cepheid, which is a molecular diagnostics company. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Thank you. And the final panel member is Dr. Rebecca Sutphin. Hi, this is Rebecca Sutphin. I'm a professor of genetics at the University of South Florida School of Medicine. And I'm also the President and Chief Medical Officer of Informed DNA, a national genetic services organization. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so today's meeting is being held in order to address 58 codes in which there was no applicable information to calculate Medicare payment rates based on the weighted median of private payer rates. You will recall during the July 31st and August 1st meetings that there were 60 codes at that time that CMS had identified that fit into this category. Since providing the list of the 60 codes on August 7th, we have subsequently learned that two, uh, two codes were erroneously placed on that list. The first code was a T code. I believe it was 0211T. Second code was 81504. We um, have learned in our review of the data that there was applicable information for that code. So having um, made that clear, on the next slide, we um, were going to have some general comments made by these um, four societies. However, I believe we are still unable to give them speaking capabilities. So until we can get that worked out, we are going to move to slide 22. And again, what I'd like to do is go ahead and start the individual code review. And on the next slide is the process we're going to use since we are not having the meeting in person in order to review the comments that have been made for these codes as well as to have the panel deliberate on the suggestions being made. So first, what we're going to do is introduce each code, its long code descriptor, 
And then we're going to ask those who did have um, presentations to go ahead and present their suggestions on crosswalking or gap filling. At that time, we're going to ask if the panel members have any questions for the presenters. And again, the process in which the panel will do that is they will raise their hand and we will unmute their lines accordingly so that they can communicate their questions to the panel members, I mean to other panel members and or to the presenters. During the second part of the code review, that is when the panel will deliberate. It, they will use a very similar process. They will raise their hand if they have questions. The questions will be asked. There will be discussions occurring between the panel members and presenters if they so desire. Finally, the panel will be asked to cast their ballots. Now, because we lack the capabilities to quickly count the ballots and then read the results to the public as we do during the inpatient meetings. We will not be able to do that during this meeting. However, our goal is to post the results of the panel's vo uh, final voting for various crosswalks or gap filling, hopefully in 48 hours after the conclusion of this meeting. So having said that, um, we're going to move to the next slide. which is the first code, and the first code is 80410, and it is um, calcitonin st stimulation panel, and this panel must include the following, calcitonin code 82308 times three. Now, um, I'm going to also interject here real quick. Our um, designated federal officer, Mr. Glenn McGurk, he will also be assisting us in getting um, each presenter uh, oriented with the slide, and then he will be um, making sure that each presenter adheres to the one minute time limit that we have set. So having said that, the next slide is uh, um, the CMS preliminary determination, which was posted this past Friday, August 22nd. And CMS at this time is suggesting that we crosswalk 80410 to 82308 with a multiplier of three. And this is the rationale for that, is that it would be consistent with the CPT code descriptor. Next slide. We did not receive any public comments on this specific um, code except that we were asked by multiple societies not to remove this code from the CLFS until more data is present. And again, once we can get the presenters access to speaking, they will be able to provide more of their suggestions regarding um, removal of this code from the CLFS. Suffice it to say, CMS has not removed it, and we have given it uh, the suggested crosswalk above. Next slide. Okay, so um, so what we'd like to do is open this up to, um, let me ask the um, Rashida to go back to the preliminary determination slide, back one more, so that the panel members can see what has been um, suggested for this code. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the, um, I'm going to ask the panel members to raise their hands if they have any questions. So the panel does not uh, want to discuss this code or the preliminary determination. Is, so I'm going to ask that the panel member fill out the ballot. And So we do have a single question from Dr. Brian Loy. Can we please unmute his line so he can ask his question? So Dr. Loy, can you please raise your hand so that uh, we know how to, um, great. You wanna, uh, can we please unmute his line? Hi, this is Brian Loy. 
just uh, would ask if you could please uh, explain the math. The 836.75 times 3 equals $110. If you could elaborate on that, please, I would appreciate it. Oh, okay. I think I believe that is a typographical error. Um, we can quickly look up on the on the um, the the uh, CLFS list what the actual cost is of 82308. I believe that's a typographical error. While um, the um, CLFS team is looking that up, Danielle, we are at a point now in which um, we will, if it's possible, to unmute the attendees' lines so that the individual people can speak with the understanding that all other people who are not speaking mute their lines. Is that a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility. Okay, great. So having said that, um, I'm going to ask all attendees to please mute your line. And when we move, uh, as soon as we are finished with this question, then I'm going to reverse the order and go back to having the presentations from the various societies. And hopefully, if everyone has muted their line, then this will allow things to be um, clearly stated. So we're still looking at the NLA for 2017 for 82308. Do we, so do we have that information? 3675. So the, um, so the NLA is $36.75, and so the eight really needs to be deleted. So 36.75 times three should get you to 110.75. All right, does Dr. Loy have any other questions? All right, Judy, uh, can we unmute Judy Davis's line? And Judy, do you have a question? It was, yes, my question was whether the amounts on here are from the new proposed fee schedule or whether they're the 17 NLAs, but I think you just said that right. a it's minute from ago. Right, 2017. Yeah, let me just okay, make thank it, you. Yeah, so um, let me just make clear that um, all of the values that were submitted to us as well as used by CMS in the preliminary determinations are from the uh, 2017 NLA list. All right, so let's do something here. Let's go back to, the, um, let's see, I think it's slide seven. And so what I'd like to do is um, ha have everyone who is an attendee please mute your line. And then if the operator could unmute all lines, and then if Mr. Paul Sheaves, can he please indicate if he can speak at this point in time? I, I'm on the line and can speak if you can hear me. Yes. So what I'd like to do is advance the slide to slide eight which indicates that this is uh, Mr. Sheaves from the American Clinical Laboratory Association, and then I'd like to advance it to the next slide. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Sheaves. All right, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to comment, and uh, I know it's frustrating getting the, the technology sorted out this morning. Um, so we had some just overall general comments that are really applicable to all of the codes. 
And that is, um, one, we, um, as, as was alluded to earlier, and we, we appreciate um, uh, CMS's recognition of that, but the, the timelines that we're really placed under um, and have, have been a case really kind of all summer with, with some of this stuff, have, have really been inadequate for notice to prepare comments and, and vet recommendations within our organizations. Um, you know, we made the overall comment that we really think the current LA should stay in place for, for these call, for these uh, 60 codes and to address these um, during next year's meeting. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of our frontline comment. Um, you know, if CMS elects to, to continue down the road of, of trying to price them this year, um, for new 2018 rates. Um, we do believe that they should be kept on the clinical lab fee schedule um, and that the, the lack of receipt of inadequate applicable information is, is not a good reason to, to take something off the clinical lab fee schedule. We submitted a comment letter that really kind of outlined a lot of the rationale for that, um, but we'll, we'll make that general comment. Um, we did, you know, in the event you, you're going to keep these on the, the fee schedule and do them this year, we had really only about seven codes that in this time frame at least we could get with our membership, um, look at, um, you know, who's performing adequate volumes for us to feel like we had um, input on. And so we will be jumping in on seven of the codes. Um, but, you know, we, we would kind of like to be able to echo some of the, the, the comments of our um, stakeholder colleagues. And it's not necessarily that because we're silent, we don't agree with those, but we really just haven't had adequate time to function as a, as a stakeholder set to, to, to make that happen. That, that's our overall general comment. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you very much. We appreciate your um, input. Next slide, please. This is um, general comments from the Association of Medical Pathology. Again, please ensure all attendees have your, your lines muted, and then could the moderator unmute a doctor's Anthony Sorecci, oh, excuse me, she doesn't have to do that. I, I'm sorry. So um, I am assuming Dr. Anthony Sorecci will be speaking. And um, if Dr. Aaron Bossler is available, please feel free to speak. You will have three minutes to present your slides on general comments. Thank you. Dr. Sirachi, are you ready to address your slides? Or Dr. Bossler, please unmute your phone if you are. Hi, Karen. Everyone is unmuted, so they should be able to speak freely. All right, so I am not sure why Dr. Sorecci and Bossler are not speaking, so let's do this. Let's go on to the next presenter. We can circle back. And this is from the American Society for Clinical Pathology, Mr. Matthew Schultz. He did not have any specific general comments in his slide deck. However, he did submit a letter for his society and uh, uh, Mr. Schultz, if you would like to speak, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is Paul Shives. I know from the emails he was having trouble even getting into the conference line. I was just emailing him. Yes, you are on and we can hear you. No, that was Paul. Th that was, Paul I'm sorry. So if Mr. Schultz is not available, as we're, okay, so Dr. Anthony Sorecci has now unmuted himself, so let's go back, and you have three minutes to present your comments. Go ahead. So Dr. Sorecci, can you go ahead? Okay, so we're still not able to hear him. All right, so can we move to the next slide? And that would be um, the, Amer the College for um, American Pathologists. Keep on going. And this is uh, Dr. Ronald McLaughlin. 
So, Dr. McLaughlin, you have the floor. Next slide. Thank please. you. Next slide. Can you hear me? Next slide. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the panel for uh, allowing us to present our comments. We also sent a letter to CMS um, regarding our concerns, and we're echoing some of the same things that you heard earlier from uh, ACLA. And we feel it's premature <clears throat> to remove the list of test codes from Medicare fee schedule, clinical laboratory fee schedule for the 2018 year. Uh, the codes represent CLFS tests. They should be listed on the CLFS. Uh, if there are criteria that must be met to include the CLFS, such as volumes thresholds, we request that CMS share those uh, with us and uh, establish the criteria through a separate regulatory process. Uh, the timeline was extremely short for us to address all these codes, and uh, we think that this should be deferred until next year's uh, CDLT meeting. And, um, you know, I think that's the most important thing we want to communicate at this point. Uh, we did not prepare any specific crosswalks because we just felt the timelines were too short. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to try one more time and go back to Dr. Sarechi. It's, we're trying to get him another line in which he could use to call in to speak. Hi, is this, was that Dr. Sorecci? This is Anthony Sorecci, can you hear me? This is Dr. Bossler. Hello, this is Anthony Sorecci. Ah, Hello? okay, great. You have the floor. Can, oh, great, you can hear me, wonderful. Uh, thanks everyone, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm Anthony Sorecci, I'm representing the Association for Molecular Pathology. Next slide. So um, these are the recommendations, the, co the codes that we're going to make recommendations on for AMP, and they're the, the codes that sit in the molecular uh, code set. Uh, next slide. So generally, the recommendations echo uh, those of ACLA and the other uh, professional organizations. We believe it's premature for CMS to remove any of the 60 codes from the CLFS based on the perceived lack of data uh, that has uh, arisen over the first period. Um, uh, additionally, we think that um, uh, the final rule actually does not state uh, that codes that don't have uh, uh, crosswalk or that don't have uh, applicable data should be removed from the CFS. Instead, they talk about crosswalk and gap filling, and so that's sort of the, the position we're going to stick with based on the final rule. Uh, and then finally, uh, y you know, the, the appropriate approach would be the, that um, already um, uh, proposed by ACLA, which is to uh, keep these codes on the CLFS with the current NLAs um, and then moving them on to uh, the next public meeting in 2018. This was not a ton of time for us to pull our members and do the appropriate stakeholder analysis, and so we, we really do think that the appropriate approach would be to keep those, the current NLAs, and then rediscuss in 2018. Um, however, we have presented uh, uh, crosswalk recommendations for a number of the molecular pathology codes uh, should that not be an appropriate approach. Uh, uh, for CMS. So next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the basis for our crosswalk recommendations were similar to that presented uh, at the public meeting in uh, July, uh, which is an analysis of the analytical methods and the resources used, in addition to the, the, the biology of, of, the, of the testing, and, and in other words, the type of genetic variant that's been interrogated, um, in addition to the, the size and, and complexity of the gene. Um, uh, we also think that because at this point there are a number of uh, molecular codes that are already on the CLFS, that crosswalk is the appropriate approach uh, uh, as opposed to the gap fill mechanism. Um, so I look forward to sharing our recommendations with the, um, with the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I, so I am understanding that Matthew Schultz is not online and is not going to be speaking. 
And then there, are, there is one more group that presented comments, and um, they did not give us general comments, and this was the whole logic group. If the whole logic group would like to have two minutes to speak about any general comments, do so now. Okay. I want to do one other thing. Does the panel have any questions regarding these general recommendations for these presenters? If you do, please raise your hand. So um, could the moderator unmute Jeffrey Baird's line? Go ahead, Dr. Baird. Oh, Hi. Ahead. Um, yeah, I, I had one, one comment just on, on relation to, to some of the comments that were just made about uh, not wanting to remove any of these uh, tests. It looks like several of the tests on here, especially the P codes towards the end, like cephalin flocculation, conger red of the blood, thymol turbidity, the blood seromucoid assay, these are all obsolete tests that are actually on Medicare's national coverage determination 300.1 for obsolete or unreliable diagnostic tests. So in other words, quack tests. And I wonder if there's any public comment of the folks who just spoke that would sort of, that would indicate that we should keep those specific ones on that are already on a list of obsolete, unreliable tests. All right, thank you very much. Can you please mute his line? Thank you. So for um, Paul Sheaves, Dr. Uh, McLaughlin, and um, Dr. Sarechi, do you have any comment regarding the fact or this observation that some of these tests are obsolete? Well, I, so this is Paul Sheaves. I, I don't necessarily have a, 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 a comment on that particular test, I'm sure. Um, the, the panel member knows better than I um, whether or not they are. Um, I think our general comment wasn't about, okay, well, we need to evaluate each one of these codes, and each one of these codes we think is a great test and needs to be on the clinical lab fee schedule. I think what our general comment was is that that's not the appropriate mechanism. Um, you know, we're, we're not just kind of going through the clinical lab fee schedule and saying, oh, well, you know, because we did, because that was CMS's rationale, right, was because you didn't get applicable data, we're going to remove them from the clinical lab fee schedule. It wasn't an issue of, well, we don't think these tests are performed because they're not good anymore or, or whatever else. Um, you know, I think if those are obsolete tests, bad tests, um, you know, something that needs to be looked at, um, you know, I think the, the way that that would usually happen is that, um, you know, you would go through and, and try to get that code retired with the AMA um, if, if you think that's... Um, you know, the way to go, or, or, or looking through coverage decisions, et cetera. I think you already mentioned their international coverage decisions. So there may be no longer a need for those codes. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is, you know, because there was no applicable information received, is that a reason to remove something from the clinical lab fee schedule? And our, our opinion was that that is not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, do, do doctors McLaughlin and... Um Sarechi, have any comment? This is uh, Nina Sarechi. I, I, I echo Paul's uh, comments. Uh, it's not the it's not the codes in particular. It's just the mechanism by which these would be removed from the CLFS uh, and the lack of com the lack of comment uh, or data during this data collection period is, is not a, uh, an appropriate reason to remove from the CLFS. That's that's and that echoes the, the general comments that Ant made. It's not particularly it's not code specific. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, going once. Yes, uh, I would echo the same the, the other two uh, speakers just uh, stated. There's appropriate mechanisms to have these removed if the codes need to be sunsetted at some point. The, the AMA is the appropriate process to go through to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, the same arguments apply uh, okay. that both Paul and Anthony both just spoke to. Thanks. Thank you very much. We appreciate your input. Okay, so um, let's go back to code one, which I believe it's on slide 24. And what we'd like to do is, hold on. Okay, so we have Dr. Schultz on the line. Excuse me. And. Um, and as far as considering these codes, we believe they should 
Okay, thank you, Doc. I mean, thank you, uh, Mr. Schultz. Okay, so I think um, we will move on to, to back to um, code one, and uh, we had a comment from Dr. Pratt to indicate that the cost, if you go to the next slide, is even at $110.75 is incorrect. It should be $110.25. So um, I'm going to ask that the panel members uh, uh, fill out your ballot. Please raise your hand when you are finished, and then we're going to move on to the next code. Okay. Please unraise your hand. We're going to go to move on to code number two. This is 80418, Combined Rapid Anterior Pituitary Evaluation Panel. This panel must include the following, adrenocorticoid hor hormone, ACTH, 8202, with a multiplier of 4, luteinizing hormone, 83002, with a multiplier of 4, follicular stimulating hormone, 83001, also with a multiplier of 4, prolactin, 84146 times 4, human growth hormone, 83003, with a multiplier of 4, and cortisol, 82533, also with a multiplier of 4, and completing the panel, the thyroid stimulating hormone, 8443, with a multiplier of 4. Next slide, please. And, um, is I don't uh, and would like some more clarity around this testing. So this is a um, a very um, this is an old code, and this is how it was described in the CPT manual, and so we at CMS followed it, and that is where the multipliers are coming from. I do believe that's um, Dr. Schoonmaker's um, question: Is why are there um, why are there multipliers for FSH? Um, is FSH actually being run four times, or is this a, 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 a um, associated amount of work similar to that? That's that's what I don't understand completely, and would need more input to make uh, adequate recommendation. So um, we have questions from Judith Davis and Gail Marcus. Could you please unmute their lines, both of them, and then we'll start with uh, Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis. She's unmuted. Ms. Davis, you have Sorry, the floor. I was muting myself. Um, I don't know this test in particular, but this is under the evocative suppression testing session, section of CPT. Many times there are medications given to patients, and then there's testing performed at various stages before and after the medication. My suspicion is that's what's happening here, but maybe some of our chemistry colleagues know more about this specific test. I guess the next speaker on the panel would be uh, Ms. Marcus. Yeah, um, my question is similar to that. Did this have, is it, this code isn't new. So was it priced before in this manner? We don't have that information and we will be looking into that. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Jeffrey Baird and then followed by Judy Davis. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is response to Vicki Pratt. I believe that this is a stimulation test. So it's, uh, you know, you, you, you do a stimulation and you measure service many time points. So that's why there's four of each. Also, I just um, spoke to the CLFS team. And as a reminder, these codes don't have data. So to ask it, uh, how this was used in the past, unfortunately, we lack that data.
Um, does Ms. Uh, Davis, and then uh, followed by Dr. Kuchar Lapati. So, Ms. Davis, what is your question? It's not a question, it's a comment. I just Googled and found that insulin, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and thyrotropin releasing hormone are all injected into the patient. And then these tests are measured at specific intervals after that in an attempt to simulate the anterior pituitary. And some of these tests could have been used in inpatients, uh, and there would not have been data if this was primarily an inpatient test. I'm not familiar with the test, but that could have been the case. Thank you. Dr. Kuchar Lapati? Please unmute his line. Please unmute Dr. Roger. Uh, this this is Roger Kuchar Lapati. I, I just wondered whether after the initial testing uh, for these different hormones uh, in the subsequent tests, whether all of them are tested or only one of them is followed? I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you repeat it, please? I, I was wondering uh, whether after the initial test for all of these different hormone levels, whether subsequent tests are done for all of them or only one or two of them are followed in subsequent testing. So you, so you want to know if the results of the panel show some of these uh, hormones to be elevated, would they be followed by more specific tests to identify uh, and, and or confirm that that hormone is increased? Is that your question? No, my question is that, uh, Dr. Nagano, if, uh, if one hormone is found to be elevated in the subsequent test, whether only that hormone level would be measured or whether all of them would be measured. So um, not being uh, an endocrinologist, I cannot <coughs> definitively say what they would do during practice. My assumption would be that they would be more focused in checking it, and so therefore there would be a subsequent test that is a little more specific, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, that's what I thought might, might be the case. If, if so, this multiplier of four for all of the hormones would be inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Um, Judy Davis, your hand is still raised. Do you have another oh. question? No, this, I do not. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so the panel seems to have a few questions about the use of the multipliers. If the panel feels that these multipliers are inappropriate and therefore the current preliminary determination is inappropriate, does the panel have other recommendations for crosswalking payment for this code? Michelle Schoonmaker. Can we please unmute her line? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi there. Um, okay, so um, I just looked up the previously priced code. I think um, the math may be a little off. The, the code um, 80418 was previously priced at 79506, so the recommendation seems to make sense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kuchar Lapati? Can we unmute Dr. Kuchar Lapati's line, please? Uh, this is Raja Kuchar Lapati. I, I was wondering if it would be possible, because of the inadequacy of the information that we have, uh, whether we can postpone this and uh, try to get additional information about exactly how this test is uh, uh, conducted. So here's, here, uh, it, it, it would be great if the panel could make suggestions at this point in time because that is the purpose of convening the panel. The public also has the opportunity to comment since this is a preliminary determination and has been posted on August 22nd. So our options are to if you um, feel that this information is inadequate and the panel can, is, does not have any other suggestions on which to discuss and subsequently vote for, then we, you can certainly indicate that on your ballot that 
you, there's inadequate information. Second of all, if the panel would like to submit public comments on a more appropriate crosswalk, CMS is very interested in hearing this information. So um, do, are there any other questions from the panel? Any other comments for discussion? Okay. So um, I'm going to ask the panel to complete that portion of the ballot for this code, 80418. We have a preliminary determination in which the suggestion for crosswalk is based solely on the content of the code. And um, There are no other public com comments and suggestions, so please complete your ballot. When you are finished, please raise your hand. So we're waiting for Dr. Kuchar Lapati and Dr. Baird. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next code. I believe, um, can you unmute Michelle Schoonmaker's line? She had a comment. Michelle? Hello? I had already made the comment that the um, 80418 was priced on the 2017 CLFS at $795.06. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to um, Dr. Loy and M Michelle Schoonmaker. Are you guys have more questions, or please unraise your hand? Thanks. Can we please mute uh, Dr. Schoonmaker's line? The third code is eight zero four three five insulin tolerance panel. And um, could the moderator please uh, mute all panel lines? I think Dr. Marcus is the last line that needs to be muted at this point in time. The third code is 80435 insulin tolerance panel for growth hormone deficiency. This panel must include the following glucose 82947 times 5, the human growth hormone 83003 times 5. Next slide. This code um, for the preliminary determination, CMS has recommended basically being consistent with the information provided in the CPT code. Next slide. We did not receive any specific public uh, comments on this code. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is open the floor up to the public for comments. So we have um, Dr. Kuchar Lopati. Can we unmute his line? Hi, this is uh, Raja Kuchar Lopati. Uh, Dr. Nagano, the, the, I think that these are, I'm having the difficulty, and perhaps some of the other panel members, is that I don't know how old these uh, codes are. But today, you know, the technologies uh, to be able to determine the levels of uh, these uh, molecules that we're looking at are relatively sophisticated and very inexpensive. Uh, and uh, so I think that at least I'm having difficulty sort of looking at the uh, current uh, coding and how much they get reimbursed and what, uh, in my view, the actual cost should be. I think that's uh, at least my difficulty. And I, if somebody could uh, uh, enlighten me about, uh, about this aspect, it would be great. Do we have any comments from the 
um, panel members to that that may have insight into responses to Dr. Kuchar Lapati's questions. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the panel members? Okay. Um, so for code 80435, does the panel want to suggest other crosswalks at this point in time? All right. So the only crosswalk that is on the table right now is CMS's preliminary determination in which we follow the suggested crosswalks from um, the C based on the CPT descriptor. We appreciate Dr. Kuchar-Lapati's comment. And so we ask that the panel members um, complete their ballot and if you are going to suggest a different crosswalk, I would say you need to raise your hand right now and so that we can discuss this as well before you do that. Assuming that is not the case, please uh, raise your hand when you have completed your ballot. So we're waiting for one more person, Dr. Baird. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next code. We're gonna turn this over to our um, DFO, Mr. Glenn McGurk. Next code is code 81316, PML RAR Alpha T1517, promyoalocytic leukemia retinoic acid receptor alpha, e.g. promyelocytic leukemia translocation analysis, single breakpoint, e.g. intron 3, intron 6, or exon 6, qualitative or quantitative. Our preliminary determination is to crosswalk 81, to crosswalk 2, I'm sorry, 81206, which is code descriptor BCR ABL1 T922, e.g. chronic myelogenous leukemia translocation analysis, major breakpoint qualitative or quantitative, appears to be similar type of test, e.g. methodology translocation analysis and breakpoint to 81316. We do have a public comment. And so for the public comment, um, Dr. Surich, Surichi or Bossler, um, you have the floor now. Please, if you are an attendee, please mute, mute your lines. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Surichi. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so AMP has re recommended the crosswalk to 81315, which is the PML RARA multiple breakpoint uh, code. One, one code above the, the, the current code. Uh, the, 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 I, I'm going to start by just saying why I think the, the crosswalk recommendation of BCR ABLE is inappropriate, and that's simply around the, um, the, the urgency and, and timeliness of this testing, uh, which requires, uh, which is done basically for the, um, the diagnosis of a acute promyelocytic leukemia, so timing is of the essence. You don't wait for batches as you do for BCR ABLE. So oftentimes you're running one to two samples at a time, the cost of which is incredibly um, uh, inflated at, when, you, when you do that. So a crosswalk to a, to a code that is uh, specific for 
uh, PML RARA is more appropriate, which is why we went with the 81315 as opposed to the BCR able code 81206. Uh, the other rationales are still there. It's a, a similar um, methodology used. Uh, the breakpoints are very similar, um, and the, so the technology used is very, very similar. But it, it really does come down to the, the medical indication for this testing, which is di diagnostic and, and acute diagnosis. Thank um, you. In this So the next um, um, comment is from the American Society for Clinical um, Pathology, and I believe this would be a comment from uh, Mr. Matthew Schultz, and this is slide 4C, slide number 36. Again, Mr. Schultz, if you would like to speak to your recommendation. All other attendees, please mute your line. So um, since um, we do not have Mr. Schultz, um, I'm going to re uh, read his recommendation. They have recommended crosswalking 81316 to 81315. Their comment is that this code should remain on the CLFS and that this code, the crosswalk code 81315, has similar methodologies and resources that are used for detecting each of the translocations. Um, I'm going to now uh, open this up for discussion by the panel members. We have Michelle Schoonmaker and Brian Loy. Could we please unmute their lines? And then Michelle, Dr. Schoonmaker can speak first. Please unmute their lines. So could the moderator please unmute Michelle Schoonmaker and Brian, Dr. Brian Loy's line. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Schoonmaker. Hi, um, this is Michelle. I was wondering for um, the AMP commenter, the code 81316 was priced on the 2017 fee schedule at $433.76. Should the 81315 have some sort of multiplier with that? Uh, thank you. This is Anthony Sorecci. Um, the, the methodologies are very, very similar, so I'd have to go back and look at why we didn't add in a multiplier to this, um, uh, to, to the 81315 code, uh, because, again, if, if the, the NLA for 81316 is, was 400-something dollars, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at why, why the, the multiplier wasn't added. So if, if there's an opportunity to comment um, offline, that, that would be helpful. So, or at least if, you, if I if have a few moments uh, to look into that, I can comment later. So this is uh, uh, the chair. So yeah, it would be great if you could respond. If not, you should be able to submit public comments. Great. Thank you. Um, the next person is Dr. Loy. Can we please unmute his line, mute uh, Michelle Schoonmaker's line? Thank you. Hi, this is Brian Loy. Uh, as we continue along here, uh, noticing that we post the national limiting amount prices, are, this is just a question for CMS in terms of clarification. Are we crosswalking to the code only, or are we crosswalking to the amount which may be subject to change after PAMA? So the 2018 national limiting amount might be different versus the 2017. So, so should we be paying attention to the amount or is it the code only? So question. as with any crosswalking, you are supposed to pay attention to the methodology. So I'm going to take your answer as being we should not be paying attention to the amounts, correct? No, that is correct. Thank you. Dr. Kuchar Lopati, can we please unmute his line? Please mute Brian Loy and Michelle Schoonmacher's line. Roger Kuchalapati. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment to that, uh, you know, again, the technologies for detecting these types of uh, translocations 
uh, is, has changed very significantly. And again, I don't know when these original courts were set up. And, uh, you know, in the past, uh, these types of translocations were detected using the fluorescence in situ hybridization methodologies. Uh, and now there are simple PCR-based methodologies or, uh, you know, genome-based sequencing methodologies that are simpler, faster, uh, less expensive. And uh, so it would be nice if uh, some of the stakeholders would actually make a comment about this. Uh, it is possible that uh, these types of codes are probably the ones that should uh, be sunset and as the uh, new methodologies are going to be used for detecting these types of translocations. So, Dr. Kuchilopati, you are asking uh, the presenters to comment on your question. Am I correct? Yes or no? That's correct. All right. Dr. Um, Sarachi, do you have a comment? And Paul Sheaves, do you have a comment? Uh, this is Anthony Sarachi. Uh, my one comment is just, uh, you know, the, the, the price of, of particularly this type of testing, at least in our laboratory with our vendors, is... Uh, inflated even for the with using RT PCR uh, because of the controls that one needs to buy for the the commercially available controls and again the the batching effect uh, for for this particular assay. So while I while I absolutely agree that the the change in technology can uh, offer cost savings, I think a lot of it is actually lost in the fact that the clinical utilization of this particular assay. Um, which, which when we run is run, again, on a batch of one or two with controls, NTC. So it, it does become a very expensive proposition. But I, again, appreciate the, the comment 100% and totally agree. Thank you. Can we unmute Dr. Pratt's line, please? Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. Um, I would echo what Dr. Uh, Sarucci said, is that um, most of PML RARA, it, and it's a test I perform in my laboratory, is done on a stat basis with multiple controls, regardless of the methodology, and it's extremely um, late, uh, cost a very costly test to perform um, and may suggest that um, even a multiplier of 1.5 may apply to this testing. Thank you. So am I clear that, Dr. Pratt, that you are recommending um, that 81315 have a multiplier of 1.5? Is that what you are suggesting? Um, yes, that is my recommend recommendation because um, every one of these comes in as a stat and, and there is a significant additional labor involved in performing this stat assay or resources involved with performing its staff. So um, am I to understand from Dr. Sarechi and Pratt that for uh, code 81316, specifically for the assessment of the PML and slash RAR alpha assessment, that this code and this service is unusual relative to other types of genetic assessment because of its size? Is that what you are suggesting? Because of the acuity of the, of, of, of the testing, which is done, you know, on a stat basis, it is not comparable to crosswalk it to the BCR able, which is, again, a similar methodology, but done in a very different clinical context. So in this case, uh, as Dr. Pratt um, suggested, often you're doing this on the same day or the very next day. You're not waiting for batching. Um, the resources required are uh, distinct and, and, and more uh, than, your tip, than, than the typical RT-PCR uh, for translocations. Okay, thank you. So um, I just want to confirm that was D Dr. Anthony Sarechi who just spoke. That's correct. That's Anthony Sarechi. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have another comment from Dr. Schoonmaker. Can you please unmute her line? Hi, 
Hi there. Um, I would like to say that I agree with Vicki and Dr. Baird that to propose 81315 times 1. 1.5 based on my understanding of the resources used to um, perform the test. All right. So um, for code 81316, we have two, we have three, um, <coughs> three proposals. The first is um, CMS's preliminary determination to crosswalk to 81206. The second one is to crosswalk to 81315. And the third is to crosswalk to 81315 with a multiplier of 1.5. You know, and I owe um, the, coll the College of American Pathologists uh, an apology. They also submitted a comment. So if Dr. Uh, Mick, uh, Dr. Ronald, uh, McLohan is still on the line. I, he is welcome to g provide his comment on the slide that is currently being seen, slide 37. I only reiter re reiterate the comments I made earlier in general statements. Uh, we just did not have the time to get all our stakeholders together. And we urge CMS to allow more time for the public to develop recommendations here. Uh, I think many services within the molecular pathology and genomic sequencing procedure subsections <coughs> require uh, similar resources and comparable technologies which are directly applicable to crosswalk evaluation. So we just feel we need more time to work with our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, Dr. Schoonmaker, your hand is still raised. Do you have another comment? Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to review what has been summarized. You currently see slide 38. You have the three crosswalks that have been suggested. There is a fourth, well actually it's really only three, that is the, uh, the preliminary determination of 81206, the second uh, crosswalk which was proposed by two of the commenters, 81315. And then there is a third suggestion on the part of the panel to use a multiplier for 81315 as 1 1.5. So the panel, please uh, complete your ballot. Please raise your hand when you have completed your ballot. We're waiting for a few more members. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Glenn again. Next code is code 81326, PMP22, peripheral myelin protein 22, e.g. Charcot-Marie tooth, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, gene analysis, known familial variant. We had a recommendation um, of, actually the preliminary termination, thank you, is to crosswalk to 81322. Code 81322 is PTEN phosphatase and tensin homolog, e.g. Calton syndrome, PTEN hamartoma, tumor syndrome, gene analysis, known familial variant. Crosswalk code 81322 appears to be similar, a similar type of test, e.g. methodology, gene analysis, known familial variant, to 81326. We do have a recommendation. Uh, the recommendation is to crosswalk to 81215, and the rationale is this te the test methods used, at the deletion and substitution types of variants tested for are both comparable to that of BRCA1, known familial variant. There's also another one, uh, another recommendation, again, as stated before, urging CMS to allow more time for the public to develop recommendations. Thanks, Glenn. So um, before we open this up for panel discussion, I'm going to open this back up to Dr. Um, Sarechi from the uh, Association for Molecular Pathology. 
Do you have uh, any further comments regarding your crosswalk 81215? You have one minute. Yes. Um, we recommended the crosswalk to the BRCA known familiar, known familiar variant code uh, because of similarities in uh, the types of variants that you can get in P, PMP22 and BRCA1, both substitution variants and deletion insertion variants, which would require different uh, methodologies uh, unique from uh, single, doing uh, simply uh, single nucleotide uh, variants. So uh, you'll use PCR for the SNVs and then a, a method known as uh, multiplex ligation-dependent probe amplification, or MLPA, for the del dupe analysis. And, and because PMP22, you'd want to potentially do both for, uh, for familial variants, you'd want uh, to use the code for BRCA, which, uh, is, which also encompasses those two types of variants. So th th you, you believe, Dr. Sarechi, that 81215 is much more specific than 81322? Yeah, actually, to, to be frank, I think 81322 is, is misvalued, but we're not talking about that. So because you can get deletion uh, duplication variants in uh, P10 as well, uh, but BRCA is a more appropriate, uh, uh, I guess, value for, for the, the resources that go into this type of testing, the, both SNV detection and del dupe analysis. Thank you. Um, uh, so um, does the College of American Pathology want to uh, provide any more input based on their slide 5C81326, slide number 42? No, I think it summarizes everything that we've uh, stated before in, in our letter to CMS as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to open this up to the floor. Um, first uh, person is please unmute Dr. Brian Loy's uh, line. Dr. Loy. Dr. Loy, do you have any comments? Your line is open. Okay, next one is Dr. Kuchar Lapati. Can you please unmute his line? Raju Kuchar Lapati. I, 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 did I hear correctly? My understanding is that uh, uh, all of these genes, uh, whether we're talking about P10 or BRCA1 or PMP22, uh, 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 the assets are all similar to each other. Uh, all types of the variants could be either substitutions or uh, small indels. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. My, my, uh, then then, then uh, I don't understand the rationale as to why you're recommending that we go to 81215. The, 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 the current uh, value for the P10 uh, code does not, I don't think, adequately, adequately reflect reflect the resources that are necessary for doing Sanger and MLPA. I think the val we think at, at AMP the value for the BRCA code, uh, A1215, more accurately captures the resources required uh, for that testing. I mean, there, 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 there are two of the, there are codes for familial variants, uh, uh, A1215 and the P10 code, uh, same, SNV and del dupe, but the BRCA code actually does capture the, or is closer to capturing the resources required for doing that testing. Is, is, does that help? Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Dr. Jeffrey Baird, can you please mute Dr. Kuchar Lapati's line and then unmute Dr. Jeffrey Baird's? So, thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Ba uh, can we go ahead, Dr. Baird? Uh, sorry, I had nothing. So. Dr. Baird, so I guess he he. I, I had no I had no comment. Thank you. Okay, can we unmute uh, Dr. Pratt's line? Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. I was just um, uh, reiterating that um, with PMP22, you're going to see more duplications, um, and so that work is. Uh, a little bit more than just sequence variants that you would that you would see with um, with the Cowden or the P10 one. So I think it would it is, um, in my opinion, that the value of work or the amount of work is more similar to the BRCA one and would be a better crosswalk. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, no more comments from the panel. Uh, can we please mute Dr. Pratt's line? And then, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Rebecca Sutphin, can we unmute her line? She has a comment. Go ahead, Dr. Sutphin. So just a clarification that when you're talking about a known familial variant, you would be looking only for one type of variant. Um, so I think there was clarification that both types of variants can be seen. Um, Dr. Pratt's comment that more likely um, you would see one type than another, but in the case of a known familial variant, you're really just looking for one type of variant. So um, in making that comment, um, I just want to understand, um, so right now there are suggestions for a crosswalk of 81322, 81215. So are you saying that one of these crosswalks is more appropriate for 381326 than the other? Um, I was just pointing out that since you're looking for a known familiar variant, you're only looking for one type of variant at a time. Um, so this issue was raised about two different types of variants that you're seeking, one with PCR, for example, one with MLPA, um, but actually you're gonna be doing one or the other at any given time that you're doing this test. So I think there may be a, a difference of opinion in terms of how frequently you would use one technology versus another, and that was Dr. Pratt's point, but you would only be looking for one or the other, not both. Danielle, could you unmute uh, Dr. Pratt? She has a question. Um, as as um, as it was it explained, it, it's more about the proportion that you're going to see more um, Duke Dell, um, especially with HMPCC, and there are some autosomal re recessive versions of of PMP22 that that that's why it would be a more appropriate for the BRCA. This, to look at maybe more than one variant or more than one variant in the family. This is Anthony Sarecci. I also agree with Dr. Pratt. The, I think the, the proportion of del dupes that you see in this gene is more similar to BRCA. So while I agree that you would at, at times only be looking for one uh, type of variant, the proportion of del dupes is, is outweighs those of SNVs. That's more similar to that uh, of BRCA than P10. Thank you. And, and I, I think that's a, that's a good point to bring up. Thank you. All right, so we don't appear to have any more uh, hand raising on the part of the panel members. So it is my understanding right now, um, we have two codes that have been suggested, 81322, for, uh, which is the uh, P10 uh, gene analysis known familiar variant. And then the second crosswalk is 81215, which is um, the uh, BRCA known familiar variant. And this is for code 81326. That is the code in which you are looking for an appropriate crosswalk. So I would ask the um, panel members to submit your um, vote through your ballot and to please raise your hand when you have completed your ballot. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Glenn. Okay, next code is code 81425, genome, e.g. unexplained constitutional or her heritable disorder or syndrome sequence analysis. Preliminary determination is to crosswalk to 81445, which is targeted genomic sequence analysis panel, solid organ or hematolymphoid neoplasm DNA analysis and RNA analysis when performed, 51 or greater genes, e.g. ALK, BRAF, CDKN2A, 
CEBPA, DNMT, 3A, EGFR, ERBB2, EZH2, FLT3, IDH1, IDH2, JAK2, KIT, KRAS, MLL, NPM1, NRAS, MET, NOTCH1, PDG, FRA, PDG, FRB, PGR, PI, PIK3CA, PTN, RET, interrogation for sequence variants and copy number variants or rearrangements if performed. Crosswalk 81445 appears to be similar type of test, e.g. methodology next generation sequencing to 81425. There were no public comments in regards to recommendations. All right, so um, we have a few um, questions coming from the panel, and I'm gonna start um, with uh, Ms. Judy uh, Davis, so if the line for Ms. Judy Davis could be unmuted, that would be great, thanks. So can we unmute uh, Judy Davis's line? I don't have a question. I failed to move my, remove my hand. Sorry. No problem. So let's go to um, Dr. Vicki Pratt. Can we please unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Go ahead. Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. Um, I think the crosswalk um, of a targeted genomic sequence of 51 or greater genes to a whole genome is largely insufficient. Um, if we're going to do that, it would need to be a times 10 um, or more um, uh, value for that um, because a whole genome is hundreds of thousands of genes and variants to analyze compared to 51 or more, um, and, and um, while I don't see a recommendation, my preliminary recommendation would be times 10, times 15, times 20, um, if we were going to make the, uh, 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 a determination. So let me summarize what you're saying. Um, you are recommending that code 81445 be uh, multiplied by 10, is that what you're saying? Um, 10 or 20. I, I would need to get more information and have a, a larger in-depth discussion, um, but if you ask me for a preliminary recommendation, it would be at least 10, if not 20. So you, we have on the table here um, 81445 times 1, 81445 times 10, 81445 times 20. That is um, what is currently being recommended. So can we hear from um, Dr. Schoonmaker next? So can we unmute Dr. Schoonmaker's line, please? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Schoonmaker. Hi. Thank you. Um, so that was my question, I guess, to some extent was, is this a full gene sequence analysis versus a targeted analysis? Um, there is a code uh, for 81317 for a full sequence analysis, or is this code for something completely different where we may want to consider a gap fill? So my question is back to you as the uh, experts. For code 81425, it's the genome, unexplained consti constitutional or heritable disorder or syndrome, and it is describing a sequence analysis. So I go back to the panel. Are you recommending another crosswalk, Dr. Schoonmaker? If yes, can you repeat the code that you are recommending? Hi, I, I wasn't actually recommending a code. I was asking the question of whether this is, um, if this is a gene sequence or versus a targeted gene sequence. Um, the targeted gene sequence code would be the 81445. A full gene sequence is, um, there's one for a PMS gene at 81317, or is this type of genomic analysis 
something that's completely different from those two methods such that we should consider a gap fill. So I guess my question is more towards um, either the public commenters or to Vicki Pratt. So, um, so it sounds like your question is asking how was this code created and used, and that would require um, us to go back and do historical review of this code and look into CPT uh, for potential insider review. So um, we can do this a few ways. Um, we can um, ask the CLFS team to pull up the CPT manual and start taking a look at that while we go ahead and look at um, other comments coming from the panel. So, um, and so Dr. Schoonmaker, we will get back to your question. Uh, can we unmute um, Dr. Um, Kuchar Lapati's line? And go ahead, Dr. Kuchar Lapati. Uh, this is Raju Lapati. I just wanted to uh, just, uh, I think uh, many of the panel members know, but just an explanation. When, uh, you know, a, a, a child, uh, you know, has unknown uh, disorder or syndrome, uh, there are several different ways in which the analysis could be done. One is that, you know, if, it, if the doctor suspects it's a particular disease, then one or a few genes will be tested. If it's completely unknown, uh, like uh, Dr. Pat is talking about, we might do whole exome, that is 22,000 genes, uh, and that is done in some places. At other places, uh, uh, they call what is called clinical genome sequencing, which is usually about four or 5,000 genes. And then this uh, states, uh, you know, the entire genome, that is very different. Uh, so it's very important for us to actually understand what this particular code is for, how many genes, which of the different ones that I just mentioned, is what is being talked about, so that we could uh, have an informed opinion about uh, what is the appropriate type of uh, crosswalk, uh, uh, if any. Okay, thank you. Um, let's do this. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, CLFS team to, um, to um, as we go through the other codes, to pull the uh, Insider's View 2015 and the CPT Assistant uh, from January 15, from January of 2015, and we will look into um, how uh, these codes are meant to be interpreted. So we're going to put this code 81445, excuse me, 81425 on hold in terms of voting, and we're going to track down that, and we will get back to you um, after that. Thank you. So um, can we, uh, uh, Vicki Pratt, um, can we unmute her line before we move on to code number eight? Go ahead, Vicki. Yes. Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. I was involved with creating this code through the AMA. Um, while there is um, there is an exome and an exome code, this is for the whole genome. Um, so it's a significant amount of, I mean, it's the whole genome. It's genes, introns, um, looking at every possible variant related to it a child or a person with an unknown diagnosis. And that's why a minimum this would be 81455 times 20. Um, I think one of the other panelists has pointed out that there is no pricing information related to 81445, um, but there, there is a sign significant amount of work related to, to this and um, and and that's why that this code was created, especially for um, children or people with an unknown diagnosis. Okay, thank you. All right. So we will now go on to code eight. I'm going to turn this over. Excuse me, code number seven. I'm going to turn this over to Glenn, and we will come back to this code when we get more information. Thank you. Next code is code 81426, genome, e.g. unexplained constitution or heritable disorder or syndrome, sequence analysis, each comparator genome, e.g. parents, siblings, list separately in addition to code for primary procedure. The 
The preliminary determination is to crosswalk to 81445. Targeted genomic sequence analysis panel solid organ or hematolymphoid neoplasm, DNA analysis, and RNA analysis when performed, 51 or greater genes. I will not go through all the, for examples again, interrogation for sequence variants and copy number variants or rearrangements if performed. Crosswalk 81445 appears to be similar, uh, similar type of test, for example, methodology to code 81426. There were no public comments in regards to this code. Okay, so um, um, can we um, unmute um, Rebecca Sutfin's line, please? Okay, this Dr. Is Rebecca Sutfin. Yep. Um, I'm guessing Vicki's going to say something similar. You know, this code being related to the analysis of whole genome, but using the parents and or the siblings for comparison with the patient's genome to help better interpret it. My, um, my comment about these whole genome codes in general is is in general in agreement with Dr. Pratt. That is, there's a there's a tremendous amount of work involved in trying to interpret a whole genome, and that I don't I have additional concerns about trying to crosswalk it to anything, even with a um, multiplier, because of that distinct difference. There isn't another code that really is similar to this, and the concern that going forward then this code is tied to some other code, um, that seems inappropriate to me. I think it should be gap filled. Thank you. Can we unmute uh, Dr. Kutcher Lapati's line? Please mute, mute Dr. Sutphins. Uh, Roger Kutcher Lapati, I agree with Dr. Sutphins. Uh, number one is that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, doing whole genome sequencing for these types of uh, cases uh, is not the current uh, practice. As I mentioned earlier, whole exome uh, is done in some cases. Uh, and the whole issue about exactly what the cost of, uh, you know, doing whole genome or whole exome uh, is something that needs to have an extensive discussion uh, at this panel. Uh, so if we were to make an immediate decision about this, the recommendation might be uh, for graph fill. Okay. Next uh, panel member is Dr. P uh, Pratt. Can we please unmute her line? This is Dr. Vicki Pratt. Um, so many people that are doing whole, whole genome are doing trios and um, so that's why this code was created to support the previous code. Um, um, so I, I, my question to, um, we could either get some, in, I would like to also get some input for AMP if they have that, or if, they're build, if they have the ability to find, um, to provide some input. Uh, I believe Dr. Sarechi was, um, he had to attend another meeting, but I don't know if he's still on at this point. So is your request um, to have Dr. Sarechi uh, respond to your question? Yes, if Dr. If Amp All right, thank you, Dr. Pratt. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. Dr. Sarechi, are you on the line? Is Dr. Sarechi on the line? I believe he had to attend another meeting, so there was supposed to be Dr. Bossler was supposed to re be replacing him. Is Dr. Bossler on the line? Uh, this is Tara Burke with um, the Association for Molecular Pathology. We're waiting for Dr. Bosler to join. All right. Um, but support um, Dr. Pratt's comments related to the work involved for um, 81426. Okay, thank you. So okay. basically, um, Dr. Bosler and Suretri are not yet available. However, I guess there's been some kind of communication going on that. Um, uh, doctor, I mean that uh, the American, um, the, the Association for Molecular Pathology supports Dr. Pratt's recommendation. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, that's true. Thank you. 
And can we, um, please, can you please repeat your name and wh who you are speaking for because we're, it's not clear at this point in time. Sure. My name is Tara Burke, and I'm speaking for the Association for Molecular Pathology. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, this is what I'd like to do: is we will um, put this code also aside because it seems to be paired with eight one four two five, and we will come back and once we get more information from the CPT Insider's View and Manuals about the intention of these codes. Can we please uh, mute Vicki Pratt's line? Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Glenn to move on to the next code. Next code is 81427, genome, e.g. unexplained constitutional heritable disorder or syndrome, reevaluation of previously obtained genome sequence, e.g. updated knowledge or unrelated condition slash syndrome. Preliminary determination is to crosswalk to code 81445 times 0.5. So it would be half of that code. Uh, the rationale is the multiplier of 0.5 for the crosswalk of 81445 is appropriate since this is, since this, the work of this uh, laboratory test is a reevaluation of a previously obtained genome sequence. We also believe code 81445 is an appropriate crosswalk since it appears to be a similar type of test e.g. methodology, to 81427. Do we have any, um, recom um, excuse me, any questions from the panel? All right. Um, can we please unmute uh, Michelle Schoonmaker's line, please? Uh, hi there. Um, this seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is a basically a bioinformatics code. You're not going to be performing the laboratory analytics to reobtain the genome. You're just going to be doing the um, analytic portion of the informatic analytic to look for um, either new um, targets based on updated knowledge or some unrelated condition as the code states. The only code that I'm familiar with that uses bioinformatics is code number 87903. It is the bioinformatics of HIV genotyping that uses the genotype information to predict a drug-resistant phenotype, and I'm wondering if that code might be an appropriate crosswalk. So our understanding of this code is that you already have the um, genomic information and you, in essence, are rechecking the previously reported outcome of that genome sequence, which to me is a little different from the bioinformatics that is used to help identify drug susceptibility. So. I'm not sure of. Now, from my, from my understanding, the bioinformatics code is using existing data to predict um, what a phenotype would be. So you would be in what I'm reading 81427 to be is that you're reading existing genetic analysis data, genetic coding data, and predicting what a phenotype would be based on your updated knowledge or unrelated or, a, you know, a new uh, mutation. Okay, thank you. Um, can we unmute Vicki Pratt's? Okay, Vicki Pratt's line is unmuted. Can you please mute uh, Dr. Schoonmaker's line? Yes, this is Dr. Vicki Pratt. Um, so, M Michelle is correct. It is a reanalysis. Um, I... I have not had experience with reanalyzing genomes. I know an initial genome is a significant amount of labor. It can be about, it's estimated around 50 hours of labor of, of variant annotation with the clinical phenotype. A reanalysis may not be 
that much, but I don't know the amount of work involved with that and may require some input from AMP. Again, this is a similar part of the other three, the other two codes that we currently have tabled, and I would suggest that we also table this one. Can we hear from Dr. Kuchar Lapati, please? Please mute Dr. Pratt's line, unmute Dr. Kuchar Lapati's line. Uh, Kuchar Lapati. I, I just wanted to just an explanation that the first time when, you know, uh, whatever genes are sequenced, and you find a bunch of uh, variants, and some of them variants can be of unknown clinical significance. And what this particular code is talking about is that uh, later on, uh, six months later, a year later, some other paper, you know, comes along, and that uh, sort of provides additional information about that particular variant. Uh, then, uh, you know, it's considered the obligation of the uh, provider to be able to provide that information back to the patient or the physician. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, in the back and forth between Dr. Nagano and Dr. Schoenmaker, I think that uh, I agree with Dr. Schoenmaker that uh, this is very similar to uh, already known variants, and if there's a new interpretation for those variants, and the so bioinformatics uh, uh, assay, Although it, you know, it requires the knowledge about the new literature. Okay, thank you. Um, can we unmute Dr. Uh, Sutphin's line? Rebecca Sutphin. Um, this is Rebecca Sutphin. I again would um, suggest gap filling here, and the reason is that the um, code is really unclear in terms of what the indication is for this reexamination. It could be, as Dr. Kuchalapati said, that there's some new specific information that, the, um, that may be relevant to the particular case and that's new compared to what was known at the time that it was originally uh, sequenced. However, the code also refers to um, potentially unrelated condition or syndrome. So, for example, um, a, a child who had some unexplained condition had the whole genome sequencing done in the first place and then nothing was really found that could explain the situation and a few years later we make a decision that we would go back and try to look at the genome again for something that might be relevant and better understood discoverable at this point in time um, so again it's not clear in terms of what is the full spectrum of how this code could be applied. And for that reason, tying it to something else um, through a crosswalk, to me, doesn't make any sense. And I would recommend gap filling. Thank you. So um, we have been able to track down information from the 2015 CPT um, insider's view. And according to the reports from the CLFS team, it is not specific. It is it does not specifically outline what is um, being looked for or tested for code um, 81425. Um, having that information, I'm going to go back to 81425 and 81426. I'm going to um, ask if the um, panel members have any other comments or questions for themselves. And if there are none, then I'm going to ask them to submit their ballot for 81425 and 426. Uh, Dr. Kuchar Lapati, can we please unmute his line? And please mute uh, Dr. Sutphin's line. I just wanted to say that my view is, you know, trying to put a multiplier of 10 or 20 without really having an adequate discussion about whether or not the whole genome sequencing is the right way to go about this for something like this, or whole exome, and how many genes uh, would not be appropriate at this time. So I would recommend uh, gap filling. OK, thank you. Um, I just um, um, received a message from another member of the CLFS team. And they have done a little bit more of uh, research. They've had a little bit more time. And they've asked to speak about, um, I'm assuming it is code 81425. OK. Hi, this is Sarah Harding. Um, 
Under the insider's view from 2015, I'm reading from the description of the procedure for 81425. This reads that DNA is extracted and sequencer-ready DNA fragment libraries are generated. Sequencing of the patient's genome is performed by MPS using sequencing by synthesis chemistry and paired end read technology. Alignment is performed and a table of variants that deviate from the reference sequence is generated with known polymorphisms and candidate variants identified and annotation provided. Uh, that last sentence is, uh, has an asterisk which states that current guidelines require that variants of interest are confirmed using Sanger sequencing. So um, now having heard that for 81425, is there any further discussion on the part of the panel? We've heard from Dr. Uh, Pratt that um, this should be multiplied minimally 81445 times 10 possibly 20, Kuchar Lapati, Dr. Kuchar Lapati is suggesting that this, uh, I'm assuming he's uh, saying that it be gap filled since we do not know exactly what is being tested. And then we know from Sarah Harding with the insider's view, it, it, the methods were outlined. And um, go ahead, Sarah. I just, this is Sarah Harding again. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure uh, that the gap fill process um, is indeed clarified. Um, I came in at the end of, of uh, one of the most recent comments. Um, I do want to stress that by choosing um, or, or by recommending the gap fill uh, procedure, um, I, I completely understand the comment that the descriptor um, really does not reflect all of the possible um, clinical uses for this test um, that uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to write one descriptor that could reflect every single instance. Um, but by gap filling the payment rate for this test, um, that wouldn't necessarily or it really wouldn't be able to take into account different um, uses of the test going forward. Gap filling will still uh, land on one single payment rate. Um, it just simply uh, more or less takes um, feedback in from our, our contractors rather than um, uh, establishing a payment rate um, uh, here uh, using the crosswalk methodology. So I just want to make sure it's clear that the gap filling, it's not like it can be gap filled and each possible scenario taken into account. Um, there is still going to be one single payment rate uh, for this test um, in the end. Thank you. Dr. Kuchar Lopati? Kuchar Lopati. I, I, uh, that's great, actually. That's a very good explanation. I, I think I need to explain a little bit more about my, what my uh, concerns are. Uh, so uh, one of the panel members sort of suggested basically that we pay for this whole genome sequencing as much as $6,000 or $12,000 for it. Uh, the reason why I have reservations about this is that there is a commercial entity that's currently providing whole genome sequencing, including annotation of the genome, for $600. So there has to be significant rationale as to why uh, it should be $6,000 or $12,000. And I don't think that there's enough time uh, today, uh, you know, for us to actually go through a proper explanation as to what is the appropriate time, you know, thing, thing to do. And so if uh, gap filling is not the appropriate way to do that, uh, my uh, recommendation would be that we table this right now uh, and that we need to have a, a significant amount of education uh, of uh, everybody and understand as to what is the appropriate uh, amount of payment that would be suitable uh, for this type of an assay. Thank you. Um, do you have a suggestion on how the panel would like to work on this before 4 o'clock today? <laughs> is this something that the panel would like to work through through lunch? 
And I will leave you to think about that because we're going to ask Dr. Sutphin for her um, recommendations and comments. Can we please unmute Dr. Sutphin's line and mute Dr. Kuchar-Lapati's? Thank you. This is Rebecca Sutphin. Um, you know, I'm in general agreement with Dr. Kuchar-Lapati and understand the comment that was made by Sarah Harding. Um, it, it really kind of, that idea that there's a spectrum of how this might be used and what the level of work might be given the indication, um, those are, um, you know, that's somewhat similar to the promyelocytic leukemia discussion where we were saying, yes, it would only be one variant that was looked at at any given time, but it could be one of two different types of variants. And what's the balance usually between how many times we would be looking for one type versus another and take that into consideration? So I think, you know, back to some of the other panel members' comments that I'm in agreement that this really des deserves further discussion and consideration. And while there's a spectrum of um, potential uses for this, especially the reanalysis um, code, that that all needs to be considered when the pricing is set. And yes, it'll be one price at the end of the day, but it really deserves more attention to the possibilities and discussion about proportions of those. So I, again, recommend gap fill. Okay. Um, do we have any other recommendations from um, the panel? Okay. So um, there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, we have on the table here code for, 81, for 814, 25, 26, and 27. Further the discussion on the part of the panel. If the panel, one, one option is to um, have the uh, panel reconvene, come up with their recommendations, and submit that as a public comment. The second option is we vote individually for 84125 using the current uh, recommendations of 81445 times 1, 81. 445 times 10 or 20. And obviously, the third recommendation would be to um, gap fill. So, having said that, um, I'm going to open this up one more time to the panel, and I would like to hear on what you would like to vote on for 81425. Dr. Kuchar Lapati, can we unmute Dr. Kuchar Lapati's line, please? Okay. Uh, Kuchar Lapati, Dr. Nagano, I, 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 I'm be, we're happy to have a conversation, but I'm not sure that we're going to be able to have a resolution because the views are sort of uh, maybe what the appropriate pricing are quite extreme. Uh, so I think if there is some uh, other way, if gap filling process would enable us to have a much more extensive discussion and our recommendations, and I think this is going to be important not only for this particular code, for this particular indication, but this is going to be true for a whole bunch of other things that the CMS would have to consider as we move forward. Uh, so I want to find a mechanism where we can have, uh, you know, informed discussion about this aspect. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So for code 81425, Is the panel asking that we allow more time to discuss this code and the other two codes at a separate meeting and that recommendations will be posted? Dr. Kuchar Lapati, can we unmute his line, please? Go ahead. You're correct. Dr. Loy, can we unmute Dr. Loy's line, please? Dr. Loy? 
Yes, Brian Loy here. Uh, I was going to say the opposite, and that is, is I'm, I am quite content voting independently. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, code 81425, since we uh, cannot come to a consensus, here are your options, and please vote accordingly. Number one, for 81425, genome um, or sequence analysis, the recommendations are 81445 times one. Second recommendation is 81445 times 10. Third recommendation is 81445 times 20. Third, uh, so that's one, two, three. Fourth recommendation is gap fill. And the last one is um, 81327 times one for code 81425. So you have five options. Please submit your, um, your ballot and raise your hand when you are finished. So we have, uh, everyone has voted. We're going to move on to 81426. You have heard the discussion for 81425. All I heard so far on the table for this code is the fact that this is similar to 81425. And I'm going to summarize the following crosswalks that have been presented. So for 81426, that's genome sequence analysis, each comparator genome. The preliminary determination of 81445, gap fill. And so I would like to hear from the panel if there are any other suggestions, and we will then vote for 81427. Dr. Kutcher Lapati and then uh, Dr. Pratt. So Dr. Kutcher Lapati. No, I was uh, just raised my hand and said that I voted. Okay. We haven't gotten that far, for, but that's okay. Um, Dr. Uh, Pratt, can we please unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Yes, this is Dr. Pratt. Uh, my recommendation, if, if we were looking, if we had uh, 81445 times 20, that for comparator genomes um, that I would do, uh, my recommendation would be an 81445 um, times one for each comparator. Okay. Uh, any other um, suggestions? Dr. Kuchar Lopati, can we unmute his line? Kuchalapati, I wanted just a uh, clarification for that. Uh, if a variant is found, uh, is that what is tested uh, in the parents, or it is three genome sequencing? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I, I'll try to understand a little bit more about what this code is for, whether the code is for sequencing the genomes of three individuals, or whether the code is for sequencing the genome of one individual, and examining the variants in the parents of that individual. Okay, if you can hold tight, we're, um, the CLFS team is looking things up in the CPT manual. Dr. Pratt, do you have another comment? Okay. Can we unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Okay, Dr. Pratt. This is Dr. Pratt. Um, for trio sequencing, um, I'm responding to Dr. Kushler Patty. For trio sequencing, um, this is what this is for, is that when you have a child with um, an unexplained condition and you're sequencing them, you also sequence the parents and um, 
uh, to look at phasing and look at inheritance and compare the variants, especially in de novo mutations, looking for de novo mutations in autosomal dominant, but you're also looking at inheritance for autosomal recessive disorders to set phase and analyze the, both, all three genomes at the same time. Okay. Okay, this is Sarah Harding. I just wanted to read <coughs> the insider's view um, for this code for 81426, uh, the description of procedure. It says DNA is extracted, sequence are ready, DNA fragment libraries are generated. Sequencing of the parents' genomes is performed by MPS using sequencing by synthesis chemistry and paired end read technology. Alignment is performed, a table of variants is generated, and variants identified in the patient are compared with parental sequence variants. That last sentence uh, is, has an asterisk saying that current guidelines require that the variants of interest are confirmed using Sanger sequencing. Any other comments from the panel members? So um, we have on the table to, for voting um, crosswalk 81445 for code 81426. A second option is 81445 times one for each comparator. The third option is gap fill. Please submit your votes and raise your hand when you are completed with your ballot. Moderator, can we please mute all of their lines? Thank you. All right. So we're going to move to the third code in this uh, family, and that's uh, 81427. Um, we have as suggestions uh, code 81445. We also have 87903, and we also have gap fill. Um, can we, I'm sorry, um, Danielle, can we unmute Michelle Schoonmaker's line and Dr. Loy, and we can, can we have Michelle Schoonmaker provide her comment first? Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Schoonmaker. Sorry, I didn't have a comment. I just forgot to put my hand on. Okay, Dr. Loy. The same for me. Okay, so please mute their lines, and then we have a comment from the CLFS team regarding code 81427. Hello, this is Sarah Harding, a reading from the CPT Insider's View for 81427. The description of the procedure is the patient's previous genome sequence was re-annotated to reflect potential new information relevant to the patient's condition. Um, I, I don't know if the panel wants to discuss that further piece of information. If yes, please raise your hand. If no, we're going to vote. Okay. So um, your options for 81427 is 81445 times 0 0.5. The second crosswalk is 87903. And of course, there is gap filling. Please raise your hand when you have completed um, your ballot. All right, so we're going to move on to code number nine. Let me just say that um, it is 11.35. We are going to stop at 12 o'clock for a 30-minute break because, excuse me, for a 60-minute break. Um, so we have quite a few codes to um, go through. So let's uh, move on to code number nine, and I'm going to turn this back over to Glenn. <clears throat> excuse me, code number nine is 81434, hereditary retinal disorders, e.g. retinitis, 
pigmentosa, Leber congenital amaurosis, cone rod dys dystrophy, genomic sequence analysis panel must include sequencing of at least 15 genes, including ABCA4, CNGA1, CRB1, EYS, PDE6A, PDE6B, PRPF31, PRPH2, PRDH12, RHO, RP1, RP2, RPE65, RPGR and USH2A. For code 81434. Yes, this is uh, Anthony Stretchy from AMP. Um, so uh, as, as the slide suggests, uh, the number of genes covered by the 81432, which is the hereditary breast cancer related disorders panel, um, is similar to the, uh, a number of genes that are requested in, in the retinopathy panel um, that were discussed in the hereditary retinal disorders panel that we're discussing. Um, Additionally, the, 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 the methodology is actually more appropriate when you look at these uh, uh, disease-specific panels relate, uh, when compared to these hotspot panels that are covered by 81445. Uh, the capture is different. The analysis is very different. Um, oftentimes, you're looking at full genes rather than hotspots. Um, so for that reason, I think the more appropriate, uh, both from a methodological and a, and a clinical perspective, the more appropriate crosswalk is 81432, uh, which is what was recommended by AMP. Thank you. Um, Glenn, you want to read the next um, slide, which has another um, The other presented. comment is, um, is there another comment? Oh, so the next one is from the American Society of Clinical Pathology. It's slide 4C, uh, 9C, slide 56. So this is um, a very similar crosswalk. It is also uh, suggesting 81432. Do we have anybody from the American Society of Clinical Patho Pathology who would like to speak to this slide? Basically, this slide is um, I uh, very identical to the um, Association for Molecular Pathology. In addition to their comments uh, regarding the crosswalk 81432, they also suggest that this code should remain on the CLFS. I'm going to ask all of the members on the panel to please unraise your hand um, at this time because I think this is left over from the voting. And then um, please raise your hand now if you have a question or a comment. So um, Dr. Pratt, can we unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Go ahead, Dr. Pratt. This is Dr. Vicki Pratt. Um, I would agree with um, Nino that um, that for hereditary retinal disorders, that it should match um, the breast cancer disorder, a better crosswalk to the breast cancer disorders as opposed to the cancer mutation hotspot, which is much more targeted than, um, than looking at. So I would recommend and support 81432 crosswalk. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kuchar Lapati, can we please unmute Dr. Kuchar Lapati's line? Go ahead, Dr. Kuchar. Kuchar. Lepati, I just wanted to make sure that I, that I understand uh, correctly. Uh, a couple of people said that 81445 is a hot spot testing. Is that correct? Um, Dr. Pratt and Dr. Uh, Sorachi, uh, would you like to respond to Dr. Kuchar Lapati? Can we start with Dr. Sorachi? And then we, this is so that Dr. Pratt's line can be uh, unmuted at this time. Sure, this is, this is Dr. Sorachi. So it, the, while the description doesn't necessarily um, uh, say that it's hotspot testing, in practice, most laboratories who perform that 50 gene panels are using hotspot uh, uh, analysis for these genes. Um, so the capture that you use, or you actually use a PCR amplification and, uh, for, uh, for running this type of uh, assay as opposed to the, the, the capture-based uh, uh, methods that you'd use on uh, the larger panels like the hereditary retinal disorders and the, and the uh, hereditary cancer disorders. So just from a methodologic standpoint and from a clinical standpoint, they are, they are quite different. Um, can, uh, we I'm here? asking a specific question as to whether the 81445 specifically is a hotspot testing. I understand the difference between hotspot testing and whole exome testing, but uh, are, are you suggesting that 81445 
is indeed for hot spot testing. I didn't understand that to be the case. It doesn't, uh, so I'm looking at the code right now for 1445 in the CPT. It does not uh, specify hot spot panel, a uh, hot spot testing, no. It's targeted so, so we, order. Right, yep. so we should not assume that it's hot spot testing. I, I assumed that it was uh, uh, all the coding sequences of all of those 50 genes. I don't think we could assume that either, but I think practically speaking, the, the, the majority of those panels that are available that use this code are hotspot panels. I agree that the code does not specify. Uh, Dr. Nagano, this has a obviously a significant amount of uh, implication for many of these types of tests uh, because hotspot testing is just looking for one or two mutations in a gene, whereas uh, you know, the g sequencing the whole gene or the, all of the coding sequences of the gene is completely different. And I uh, assumed 81445 refers to sequencing all of the coding regions of all of those genes, uh, in which case uh, this particular panel, uh, in this particular case, is only about half of that. And, uh, and the recommendation by uh, uh, CMS seems to be appropriate. Thank you. Um, Dr. Pratt, can we please unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Can we unmute Dr. Pratt's line? Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Pratt. This is Dr. Vicki Pratt. Um, the genome sequencing procedures, um, when the 81445 was created, it included both, um, it primarily included hotspot testing and, and, and for those people that choose to, it's a panel code, it's method agnostic. So whether you're doing hotspot testing or you're doing whole gene sequencing of those genes or mate pair sequencing for looking for the deletions and duplications that, that may be included. So, um, but it, but as Dr. Sorecci pointed out, most all the people performing 81445 are actually doing hot spot, hot spot, hot spot sequencing and not doing whole genome sequencing or I mean whole gene sequencing. And again, I reiterate that the, that I believe the correct code to crosswalk it to would be 81432 for the amount of service and work involved. Thank you. Any more comments from the... If, um, I, if I may add, if I, may add I, just, I don't remember, Dr. Nagano, but uh, you know, there is another code for uh, sequencing uh, Lynch syndrome and our germline uh, mutations that we considered the last meeting and that this particular one is also very similar to that, and uh, uh, I, I don't know what the code for that is. Uh, that, that may be another one to consider. So uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Kuchar-Lopati. So are you, what is the other code you're suggesting? He's not suggesting. I don't know the, I don't remember the code number, but it's a code for sequencing all of the coding portions of uh, uh, like 12 or 13 genes uh, that are implicated in Lynch syndrome uh, that we actually considered at our last meeting and uh, for which there is a code. But I, unfortunately, I, I don't recall the number of that code. The, I, this is Dr. Sorecci, if I, if I might add. I think you're referring to code, code 81435 which is the hereditary colon cancer disorder uh, uh, code with an NLA of 80233. Um, is, that, is that right? That's correct. So in, in that case, it's a minimum of 10 genes. We consider that code, but because the, the minimum genes written in a retinopathy panel, um, it's 15 in this particular, uh, on this particular description. And, and frankly, practically oftentimes many more than on a colon cancer panel. We, we opted for the larger uh, comparison. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to summarize what we have on the table right now. So we have for uh, code 81434 the suggested crosswalk of 81445 times 1. Second one is 81432 times 1. 
And um, am I understanding that, Dr. Kuchar Larpati, you are recommending 81435? So let me explain that situation. So uh, all of these different assets that we're talking about are always sequencing the germline DNA, and uh, all of these really involve uh, sequencing all the coding portions of uh, all of those genes. And that the number of genes, obviously, in each of these cases varies, but in some cases it could be 10 or 12 or 15 or some other number. And in all of these cases, the, you know, the technologies are the same. You need to be able to develop the capture reagents to be able to capture all the coding sequences for the genes that you're interested in. Once the capture was made, then all of those uh, sequences have to be made into a library, and then they're subjected to sequencing uh, and then the analysis. So the number of genes that are actually involved in it uh, does make a difference, but in a small differences in the number of genes doesn't make that much of a difference. So it seems to be somewhat inconsistent that we have, you know, so many different codes for a gene, uh, you know, that involves 10 genes or 12 genes or 15 genes, because the actual amount of effort that is required to be able to analyze, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 genes is not significantly different. And uh, so I'm trying to think of ways of reconciling all of these things and having so many different codes uh, for this that we're discussing. But, you know, in the previous discussion, we've already agreed that 81445 uh, is quite, is a, is a good code for sequencing up to 50 genes. And that now, you know, we have, you know, obviously panels that are smaller than that. And we're trying to make a case as to why they should, we should be paying more. Uh, that, that is what I, I'm trying to get my head around. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so in the interest of time, um, I'm going to repeat what has been suggested one more time and ask the panel to submit your ballot. The first uh, crosswalk is 81445, and the second crosswalk proposed by the um, two specialty societies was 81432. Please, and obviously, you can always consider gap filling. So please um, complete your ballot and raise your hand when you have done so. I'd like to get through in the last 10 minutes uh, code 10, if that's possible. I'm going to turn this over to Glenn. Dr. Baird, we're waiting for you. So, yep. OK, so let's move on to code 10. Code 10 is 81470, X-linked intellectual disability, XLID, e.g. syndromic and non-syndromic XLID, genomic sequence analysis panel, must include sequencing of at least 60 genes, including ARE, ATRX, CDKL5, FGD1, FMR1, HUWE1, IL1, RAPL, KDM5C, L1CAM, MECP2, MED12, MED MID1, OCRL, RPS6KA3, and SLC16A2. Our preliminary determination is to crosswalk to code 81445. We did have a public comment, um, a recommendation to crosswalk to code 81432 times 2. 81432, hereditary breast cancer related disorders, e.g. hereditary breast cancer, hereditary ovarian cancer, hereditary endometrial cancer, genomic sequence analysis panel, must include sequencing at least 14 genes, including ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2, BRIP1, CDH1, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, NBN, PALB2, PTEN, RAD51C, STK11, and TP53. Is similar methodologically, sorry, using a larger number of required genes in the XLID panel is roughly equivalent to twice the resources required for code 81432. Um, we're, I would like uh, the American Society for Clinical Pathology, if they would like to um, give their comment, I ask them to do so now. You have one minute to have uh, to uh, uh, share your comment. We have no one from the American Society for Clinical Pathology, so Glenn, you want to read slide 10C 
Slide number um, 61. Uh, it's the same, uh, same crosswalk recommendation, 81432 times two. Right, and this is also from uh, the um, Association for Molecular Pathology. Does Dr. Sarechi, do you want to provide any further comment? Yeah, this is Dr. Sarechi. So I'll add that um, 60 genes are, the, the minimum is 60 genes here uh, compared to the 15 genes that are um, requ re required for the BRCA code or for the hereditary um, cancer code. Um, additionally, we offer that we used to offer this testing in my laboratory. The, the panels are generally much larger than even this, those 60 genes. The amount of work, not only the amount of sequencing that you have to do for that amount of genomic material, but also the interpretation of these particular panels are quite complex, and the analysis is quite complex, which is why we support a, an NL, uh, uh, a crosswalk to two times the hereditary cancer panel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open this up to the panel. And I just want to remind the panel that it would be really great if we could discuss this efficiently and um, vote on this by 12 noon. So um, can we open the lines up to um, Ms. Gail Marcus? Go ahead, Gail. Gail, do you have a comment? Okay. Uh, Dr. Vicki Pratt, do you have a comment? Um, I would I would support um, AMP and agree that um, usually these are large panels. It's at least double of what um, would be for hereditary breast cancer, and it is not hot spot testing, which is um, which was the suggested eight one four four five. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuchar Lapati. I just wanted to comment that uh, indeed uh, it takes a little bit more effort to sequence uh, larger panels. Uh, but, uh, you know, the number of variants that are present in any given patient is one. And uh, so the uh, argument that there is a greater amount of analysis uh, probably cannot be well supported. This is Dr. Church, if I can comment on that. Yeah, you can comment on that. And um, you need to speak slowly, and you need to repeat your name and possibly get closer to your speaker because much of what you're saying is jumbled. Got it. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of the number of, of genes that are sequenced, I agree that oftentimes there's only one pathogenic variant. But getting to that pathogenic variant when you have, you know, 150 genes and, you know, novel missense variants that aren't shared with, you know, with the parent, um, can, can, you know, is, is actually quite uh, uh, substantial, that amount of work. And the more genes that you add, the more noise that you add. Um, and so that's, that, you know, as someone who signs out these cases, that's, that's what we see. It, it, it does take more effort uh, and, and more analysis, actually, uh, for those larger panels. So is it fair to say you believe that your crosswalk A1432 is more applicable because it's capable of covering more, a greater number of genes? 81432 times 2 um, is a more, more appropriate crosswalk, yeah, that's what we believe. Because it covers a, a greater number of genes. Because a greater number of genes, exactly. So it, as opposed to the 15 genes in 81432, uh, the, we're recommending 60 genes. Oftentimes, many more are sequenced. And so we're, we're, we try to approximate that with a multiplier of two for that reason, yes. OK, thank you. All right, any more questions from the panel? Dr. Marcus, I mean, Gail Marcus, your hand is up. Do you have a question? Your line is open. Okay, so can we mute all the lines for the panel members, and then can we? Um, I'm going to. I'm going to um, read the, uh, the summary for of suggestions. So you see on slide um, 62 that the suggested cro crosswalks include 81445 times one. Um, and there are two societies that are suggesting 81432 times 2. Please submit your votes and raise your hands when you have completed your vote.
Okay. So um, we now um, have completed the first 10 codes. We have 48 more to go. We're going to start promptly at 1 p.m. unless you want to plow ahead and try to get the last, uh, try to get code um, 11 done in four minutes. I say um, we go ahead and take a break. And we will be back at um, 12 noon sharp. Excuse me, one o'clock sharp, sorry. We're sorry. So we will um, be speaking with you then, thank you.